What a wonderful change in my life has been brought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Lots of joy are my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were Joy or my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, verse 5 I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came. Joy or my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I know cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond no measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain. Help me then in every tribulation So to trust thy promises, O Lord That I lose not faith's sweet consolation Offered me within thy holy word Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble Pat!
All right, I'm going to ask you, if you will, please, to um, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Won't be saying that again. We're finishing up Luke chapter 19. Um, actually, I'm just going to primarily be looking at the final four verses, but I'm going to roll back a little bit earlier in the chapter uh, in order to read from verses 41 down to 48. Um, we're going to see as we read this whole passage in continuity that there's a sudden shift in the attitude and the actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. At one point, he's entering into the city, and his mind and heart is gripped by one emotion, and as he responds to what he sees entering into the city. And then we're going to see him actually going into the outer court of the temple complex, what they refer to as the court of the Gentiles. And, well, his mental, emotional makeup is there quite different. And his behavior suddenly undergoes a substantive change as well. And I think that there are some lessons that we might be able to observe as we compare both of these two events that uh, they were occurred in quick sequence. So we got a, like a, a movie here of Jesus walking along and He's going through this set of circumstances, and here's his mindset and his actions and what he's saying and doing. We go a little bit further down the road. We enter into a new precinct there, and suddenly new thoughts, new feelings grip him, and his behavior undergoes a change. And there's reasons why that we want to get a hold of here this morning. So let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading, if you will please, at verse number 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto they, thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and shall compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now I read that much last week and preached on those particular words. Right, And we, we discussed the fact that at that particular time, Jesus Christ was coming into a nation that was ill-prepared as a nation to receive him for who and what he was. And so this was a prophecy, obviously. I'm not going to go in and re-preach last week's message. We finished that part, but just for review and for those that might not have been there, it was a prophecy. He said this around 33 uh, A.D., and it would be in 70 A.D. that the very prophecy that he gave would be fulfilled just as he gave it, all right? So that he's actually, at this point in time, many of the people that were there with him on this triumphal entry, they would have lived in their own lifetimes if they were young enough. Forty years later, they would have been around and saw that his words, his prediction came to pass. It was a judgment that he pronounced and set in motion even as he rode into the city and spoke. But as he went further, I want you to notice the change in verse 45. And he went into the temple, and he began to cast out those that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people, they sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. Not everybody has ears to hear, but where there are ears to hear, Jesus Christ will be lifting up his voice whether through a minister, through his word, through whatever, he will be speaking to those that have an ear to hear, 
And it's a happy note, at least, that the passage ended on. So he enters the city weeping, and then he enters the temple in a state of anger. He pronounced a judgment upon Jerusalem, and by de facto, we understand, upon Israel as a nation, for Jerusalem was indeed the capital city of the nation. But here, what he's doing in the temple is he's actually, usually they say he's clearing the temple, or more often, he's cleansing the temple, because he was offended at things, religious corruption that was there that ought not to have been. And it awoke in his heart such a righteous indignation that he began just to clear it out. He was acting in, well... Anger. We, I mean, we see clearly. Now, uh, th- that in itself, you know, when you compare the two places, the two passages that we just read, that might bring a question in your mind and say, why bother to cleanse a temple that you've just said is marked for destruction? I mean, if it's already marked for destruction, why not just let it go? Why not forget about it? Why all of a sudden is there this impetus in your heart to go ahead and cleanse it? And I want to see before we get end, I I hope that I can show you that this is something very different in spirit and intent. What he does when he goes into the temple complex, and it'll come clear as we see exactly what's going on and why, that instead of sorrow, because a judgment irreversible is being pronounced, this is the administration of a chastisement Well, there are their hearts present that if they will hear it properly, it will do good. And before, as we see the events that quickly follow, it does do good. There is, in the wake of Jesus' cleansing of the temple, at least two things that we're going to see that follow from it that shows that he has not given up on people. He has pronounced a judgment on the nation as a conglomerate or corporate whole, because in his foreknowledge, he knows. But he also knows the hearts of all men. And he works relentlessly and indefatigably to get the word of truth into any heart, anywhere that is open to receive it. He'll never, ever stop. Someone says the devil is relentless. Jesus Christ is more so. And his work is never in vain. It always produces a result so here in Luke what it says was that he cast them out of the temple he cast the those that were selling the animals for ritual sacrifice he cast them out of the temple and we we actually the the word for that casting out is ekbalo and it's the exact same word when used it when he cast out demons okay that there's a, a it's an authoritative command get out that kind of a thing with this casting of them out. Mark adds that uh, he would not suffer people to be carrying vessels and things through the temple complex. If you go into Matthew, you read that he was actually overturning the tables of the money changers. That's a, you see a bit of violence in that. There's anger there. It's not even being concealed. Here's guys, they've got you know, Judean coins and Roman coins and coins from all the areas of the kingdom and people are coming in for exchange rates and they got all these coins, you know, in boxes or however they're there and he just upsets the whole table and everything gets scattered everywhere. He overthrew the tables and some of the chairs. And, uh, you know, um, he actually did this twice. This is very interesting, but Jesus Christ... At the dawn of his ministry, almost one of the first things he did was he cleansed the temple. Now, in order to read about that, you have to go into John's gospel. In John chapter 2, right after the very, very first miracle that he ever did, the changing of water into wine at Cana of Galilee, his his miracle, his, his ministry is just getting started. That's his debut miracle. He turned water into wine. And the next thing he does is he goes into the temple complex and he clears it out. The Bible says there that he actually made a cord. He he fabricated a scourge of cords, and he began to drive out the sheep and the oxen. And he said to the people that sold the doves, he says, you know, get these things out of here. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Well, in a word, 
what it was that was driving the anger of Jesus Christ in his heart. It was the commercialization of the sacred. That something that in the plan of his father had been dedicated for the good of souls and for them to come to him and receive blessing of God, all of a sudden it was being co-opted by greedy men who had a view for their own material profit and he was very angry. And I think to best understand the nature of his anger and why it was so justified, and to see the nature of the offense that he was angry at, we should go back to those very scriptures that we saw him quoting. Um, he quotes it in verse number 46. Look at what he says there. It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, that's not all one quotation. He actually, in there, he quotes from two different uh, Old Testament sources, from both Isaiah and Jeremiah. And when we go and look at the context of what's going on in those places where he quoted from, we all of a sudden, we begin to understand what is really driving his anger. And we begin to understand also the very good thing that he was aiming to do. So go back, if you will, please, to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to go ahead and begin reading there in Isaiah chapter 56 at verse number 3. Neither let the son of the stranger, or I'm going to, if you're reading a King James Version, that's what it says. But actually the word there, it, it, it is a reference to a foreigner. Which, if you're a foreigner to Israel, that means you're a Gentile, right? And so he's talking about, he's, he's speaking out of a concern for Gentile people. That would be your foreign extraction. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name, better than of sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And also the sons of the foreigner that join themselves unto the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. I'm going to bring them into my kingdom. They're going to be part of my people. I'm going to love them and make them joyful in my house of prayer. There's the reference, the one place in the Old Testament where God refers to the temple as his house of prayer. And their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called, and here you have it the second time in the same verse, and house of prayer, underscore it, for all people, all people. Not just the Jewish people. It says in verse 8, The Lord God which gathered the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him as well. Sheep that are not of this fold. God's plan is international. In Abraham and the covenant given to him shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now how does this correlate to what's going on. In order to understand this, I want you to realize that when Jesus Christ went into the temple to clear it, where he was doing this was in the outermost court of the temple. Okay, This was called the court of the Gentiles. There was in, within the, the temple complex, there were a system of courts. The largest, the, the most far-flung, and the one that swallowed up all the others, the outermost court was called the court of the Gentiles. You could go and there was another court closer to the actual temple itself, the Holy of Holies. 
and that was called the Court of the Women. You could go a little further, even beyond that. And where the women stopped at the Court of the Women, you could go further, and there was the Court of the Men. Okay, that's the third court. And then you can go even beyond that and then would go, be able to enter into that fourth and final court except the priests. And it was a priest that there administered the sacrifices. So this outermost court is where he is actually running around with his whips and cords and making a fuss saying, my house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. The vision and view and plan of God was that, yes, Israel would be for a witness, my people planted, but that they should attract people from all other nations, and that all nations should come from various parts of the world in order to worship at this place where my name dwells. And of course, there are people, and they are coming from all places. There are God-fearers, as they were called, amongst the Gentiles and scattered about, and they came from far distances to worship. And where are they? And when they would come, can you imagine this? You're coming into Jerusalem for to worship. And all of a sudden, you run in. The first thing you run into is a crooked money changer who, changes, who, who makes a profit off of your exchange rate by adjusting them. They say, well, you know, you give me that in your Roman currency. Because you have to use temple coin here. Sorry, you have to use temple coin here. And then you can uh, go over there and get yourself with temple coin, a sheep, a dove, whatever you're going to get. And then you, you, so you get gypped by the money changers. Then you go over here. And these are people that believe in God. And this is as far as the Gentiles are actually able to get. They can't get any closer. Now, what is this experience? Because they, they get gypped by the money changers, and then they have to go pay, you know, what, $25 for a pigeon or a turtle dove or something like that? What, what's going on here is they're being gouged, and all of a sudden there is profiteering being done, and it's not just privately done like these are public vendors. You know who the chief beneficiaries of all of this stuff is? The priests in the temple. And those that operate the temple, they get a cut of what the money changers make. They, you know, the very ability to set up a booth or a stall in that outer court, you have to give to the court, you know, your dues and, and your payment in order to be able to do that. And so it was very definitely to the financial advantage of the official religion of Israel, that all these God-fearing people were coming in and they were just all of a sudden, okay, now this is where the big God, right? The real true God is. This is the God of, yeah, we read about that. We heard about through some Old Testament scriptures. Yeah, part of the Red Sea. And, and you get there and who are these people? Um, if you'll turn over there to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7. I just want to read another verse here. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse number 9. I'm going to read down to verse number 12. Jeremiah 7, verse number 9. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say that we are delivered to do these abominations? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? Is that what it's become? In your eyes, behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now into my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it. For the wickedness of my people. He says, you remember back when Eli was priest over the tabernacle? Before you even had a grandiose temple? But my name was set there at that tabernacle. And when all these carnal worldly excesses, this, this covetous desire for gain, began to corrupt your religious practices. Um, I suppose maybe the very best way to make this clear. I'm just going to quickly read... Um, something that was written by David Gooding. Now listen to this. He, he will explain very, very clearly exactly what's going on. Somebody, of course, had to sell the required sheep and birds to would-be worshipers. 
But these sales, they should have been left to the secular trade unassociated with the sacred precincts and activities of the temple. For the temple authorities not only to allow this trading to go on in the temple courts, but to profit unduly from the sales themselves was not only inappropriate, it was scandalous. Instead of being priestly intermediaries to help men find and worship and be blessed by God, well, they had become middlemen, turning their priesthood into a commercial monopoly that in order to make a financial profit out of, uh, profit, out of men's quest for God. They thus robbed men. For it is difficult to experience the grace of God and the free gift of his salvation through the services of men bent on making money out of your spiritual need. They also robbed God, treating his word and sacraments as though they were stock in trade of their own business and treating God's people not as God's possessions to be developed and nurtured for God's enjoyment but as a market to which they, as the professionals, had exclusive rights. And this is what burned him up. This is what all of a sudden Jesus Christ, he's looking at the hypocrisy. And, you know, we begin to see some things. We see, first of all, that Jesus Christ, he has no great love of the things that man thinks are so fine. The materialism of that beautiful temple meant absolutely nothing to him. Oh, yeah, they had dazzling white marble stones that were brought in at great expense. You know, the whole complex, I mentioned this, it, it covered 36 acres of ground. There were multiple buildings and multiple courtyards. It was a wonder of the world. It was magnificent. And people could walk in there and they would be in awe and oppressed. And, you know, it's like, but and all of a sudden, when all, for spiritually speaking, there was... Well, Jesus Christ was very disappointed and very displeased for it. Because what he's looking for, he's not looking for, the, you don't have to have a great, wonderful temple complex. What he wants more than anything else, he just wants people to love him with all their heart and all their soul. Matter of fact, maybe the best way to give it to you, turn over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. The Gospel of John and the fourth chapter. And here we're going to see him in his own words describing more or less what I've just kind of just tried to set before you. He's concerned for all nations, not just Israel. And he wants Israel to be useful and that he can reach other nations. And here we actually find him, John chapter 4, and look at verse number 19, if you will. Verse 19, and I'll read down to verse 26. This is that exchange that Jesus Christ had with the woman of Samaria. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers, they worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Jesus answered unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. It's not the place. It's not the physical material location. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him from every kindred, from every people group under heaven. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Those are the great qualities that Christ was looking for and which he did not find. He saw the grandeur of the temple, and he saw what it was doing to the inward vital religion in the hearts of men. The woman said to Christ, I know that Messiah is coming which is called Christ, and when he is come, he will tell us all things. Now look at how plainly he says it to them. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am he. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. Well, he wasn't able to say that in many cases to his own people for reasons of personal security, but here we have it. And so 
The other thing that I would have you to notice about this as a difference between the two, when he was weeping and in sorrow and he pronounced the judgment over the city, well, it was exactly that. It was a judgment pronounced. But what we have actually going on here, it's not a judgment pronounced. It is a kind of a chastisement that's being administered in the hope of actually accomplishing some good. If you go back where we were there in Luke chapter 17, I want you to just notice two things that immediately follow his clearing of the temple. Now notice it, he, did not, he did not totally destroy anything. It's not like, you know, when Titus goes and raises a city, it's all done with and scattered and, and everything. No, no, no. He did show divine displeasure. But the effect of it afterwards, they could pick up the money tables again and clear everything up. He gave them the, something to think about, and it turns out that it was reformative, and it had an impact. Not the same impact. Well, here's what we see. In ver the last two verses of chapter 19, he didn't leave the temple, by the way. After he had gone in there and cleaned that outer court of the Gentiles, the outer court of the Gentiles got cleaned. He went a little deeper, and it says he taught daily in the temple. Now, the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people, they sought to destroy him, but they could not find what they could do for all of the people who were very attentive to hear them. One of the things is, is after that clearing of the temple, they were astonished. Who does that? I mean, they had been, you know, amongst themselves. Everybody kind of knew that there was hypocrisy going on. But they didn't say anything. There was nothing they could do about it. And then suddenly this man is just like, their mouths drop open. They're looking. They're aghast. Who does this? He goes in there with all this authority, and all this stuff that comes out of his mouth is perfectly true and undeniable. And they're meekened by it. And, the, and it gives them pause for thought. And they begin to think, and they're, who is this man? And they become very, very attentive. They're all of a sudden hanging on his every word. You know, Jesus Christ knew that through such an action, certain hearts would be touched in such a way that that would be what happened. Now, other people, it affected them a little bit differently, and he knew that as well. Look at chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. I'll just look at this real quickly. See, some of them were offended, and they were angered. It came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and the scribes came unto him with the elders, and they spoke unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority do you these things? And who is he that gave you this authority? You know, who, you know you're running around and clearing out the temple, all this stuff you're doing, who gave you the authority to do that? By his action of going into the temple and clearing it out, he began to work in the hearts of those whose hearts were humble enough to work in. And others were so alienated that we, we actually begin to see a crack and a, a, a division intensify. Where It's like one of those things where, all right, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Here's the ultimatum. You decide whose side you're going to be on and get on it. I'm coming in as one with authority, and I'm coming in to tell the truth, and this is the truth. You listen, you either hear my word or you reject what I have to say. And it's as simple as that. And it impacted men very, very differently, but very, very mightily. I see that I'm running down low on time. But there is a pattern there to be observed. And I believe that it's always in God's dealings with men and with nations to follow a very similar pattern. And this is what it is. That Jesus Christ and God, they never, ever, ever give up seeking for the good and to do good. And there comes a point in time when a nation or a people group, if they can inveterately invest their hearts in something that is against him, where they make a decision, right? They, 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 we're going to do it our way. We're going to, if there's doubt, we're going to chew it up and spit it out. We're going to do it our way. Our, our heart is set. And all of a sudden, judgment is pronounced and that particular group of people you know will be brought in judge but then he always everything filters down to an individual status where there's always going to be an elect there's always going to be a remnant there's always going to be those even within 
that are not going to be caught in the world's momentum. Maybe multitudes will go out on the Broadway, Broadway, but not every. There is always going to be some that will be amenable to his voice and surrendered and submissive to his spirit. And he begins that sometimes with a little bit of sharpness. And he begins to act in order to chastise, to call men back to their senses, to say, listen, it's, it's time now. Judgment has been pronounced. You can't prevent it from falling, but you can make sure that it doesn't fall on you. I call you back to myself because what will roll over the nation in due season, according to my word, is not something that you want to have roll over you, and it does not have to be. I see in that an ongoing message that never ends for people in the world because as he dealt with his own chosen nation of Israel, so he will deal with others. We can look around this in the world today, and I am getting ready to close. Some of you look like you're about ready to fall asleep. But um, <clears throat> let us just look to him and understand of a certainty that no matter what does happen in the world around us, God is good and he is on our side. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would bless us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We thank you so much, Lord God, for all that you do. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.